Good evening, friends. Uh, I'm Isuran Subramanian, sub. I'm a research professor at Carnegie Mellon University. I'll be your host today for this lecture. Welcome to the first lecture in the series of lectures in Reimagining Engineering in India, organized by CRE, a collective for reimagining engineering in India. CRE is an informal organization devoted to promoting reimagining engineering in India, involving business, industry, public policy, technology, academia, and civil society. The initial activity of the organization is a periodic, monthly, or fortnightly internet-based seminar in which members and invited guests participate to actively share their ideas, attempts, and results of region, rejuvenating engineering in India. Over time, we expect to add other activities and other ways we can uh, achieve the objective of facilitating the development of engineering innovation and leadership in India. This is our, the first of the series of lectures and Professor Sudhir Varadrajan from IIIT DM, Kanchipuram, will be giving the lecture on design centric engineering in IIIT DM challenges and learning. The next lecture is by Professor P.M. Rao on March 1st from IIT Delhi, which will be reimagining engineering as a verb, not just as a noun. For today's lecture, I'll repeat the topic, Design-Centric Engineering in IIIT DM, Challenges and Learning. Professor Sudhir Varadrajan is presently the head of uh, head School of Interdisciplinary Design and Innovation at the Indian Institute of Information Technology, Design and Manufacturing, Kanchipuram, an institute of national importance under the Ministry of Education. He has been associated with IIIT DM Kanchipuram since 2015, and is involved in shaping the interdisciplinary design and entrepreneurship curriculum and the incubation and innovation system. He's also the founding director of Made It Innovation Foundation, a design-driven technology business incubator, a Section 8 nonprofit company. Sudhir Varadarajan's approach to design and innovation is grounded in two decades of action research experience in facilitating strategic change and innovation and playing leadership roles in two of the top five Indian IT service firms. He's the author of a book entitled Managing Nothing, a narrative and query into innovation and leadership in the IT industry, where he draws attention to the importance of everyday micro interactions in dealing with paradoxical uh, issues relating to innovation. He holds a PhD in systems engineering uh, public system, master's in industrial engineering, and a bachelor's in mechanical engineering. Sudhir, it's all yours. Thank you very much. Thank you, sir. Uh, good evening and good morning to all of the uh, audience here. Um, so I thank uh, Cree for this opportunity to share the uh, experience that uh, we have had with the uh, AAA TDM uh, over the past uh, eight years. So I'll uh, share my screen and then uh, I'll take about 40, 45 minutes to uh, make this presentation. Uh, in case you have any comments, questions, please feel free to put it on the chat. Uh, we will take it up uh, once we finish the presentation. So the way I've structured this presentation is broadly in uh, three uh, parts. Part A, I'll briefly talk about the genesis of this institute uh, and the challenging vision that it has got. Second, I'll talk about the first iteration that we went through in terms of developing this interdisciplinary design-centric program at an undergraduate level and at a dual degree level. Then the iteration two, which is mostly the last three years, that we are doing in terms of expanding the program and uh, launching a few other uh, programs as well. This is how I've structured the presentation. So if you look at the history of uh, how IIIT DM Kanchipuram came into place, uh, it has its roots in some of the uh, uh, trends within the country as well as global. So one is the 
expansion of the global IT outsourcing industry that happened in the 1990s in India uh, led to a lot of uh, need for talent uh, for the IT industry. And uh, most much of the industry was relying on the engineering work for engineering talent coming out of the academic institutions as, as one of the major feeders for the uh, IT industry. Uh, but at the same time, there was also a challenge in terms of looking at the competitiveness within the manufacturing sector. And uh, one of the things that emerged from the uh, expansion of the IT industry was the formation of the two first institutes called the International Institute of Information Technology at Hyderabad, and then later at Bangalore in the late 1990s. And these two institutions came from a public-private partnership model. And uh, seeing the initial success of these two institutions, the Ministry of Education, which was called the Ministry of Human Resource Development at, uh, in, prior to 2020, there was a plan to expand this concept of IIITs and have one IIIT in each of the uh, states uh, within the country. And um, so about uh, 16 to 20 IIITs were eventually created as part of this uh, plan to meet the demand of the IT industry. But also what happened was a few IIITs were chosen, about five IIITs were chosen to focus on specific domains. Like for example, the IIIT Valier was asked to look at one domain, whether governance and the another IIIT Alhabad was looking at management. So there were two institutions which were mooted to look at uh, the um, called the IIIT DNM, which is largely the uh, IT and engineering uh, nexus. Uh, this one was in Jabalpur um, that was set up in 2005. And the second one was IIIT DM Kanchipuram, which came up in uh, 2007. Uh, 2007, uh, the IIIT DM Kanchipuram was asked to be mentored by the uh, Indian Institute of Technology in Madras. Which, uh, both are based in Chennai. And um, so that, that was a mentor institution for IIIT DM Kanchipuram. Globally, if you see around 2007, there have been some changes going on in terms of re-looking at engineering education, starting with uh, the iFoundry initiative with Illinois Institute of Technology. Similarly, we have had uh, in 2009, I think uh, SUTD was set up in Singapore with uh, partnership with MIT. And there was also a significant expansion within the IATs, which happened in 2008. Um, the number of IATs were increased. Uh, there was also a faculty shortage, but one of the key things also started happening, largely out of the global financial crisis, was the acceleration of the digital trend. And this movement towards startups and other things started uh, taking shape uh, around that period. Uh, so IIIT DM, which started off in 2007, for, for the first four years, it was based out of the IIT Madras in Chennai within their campus before they moved to their own campus in uh, 2011. So the institute initially started by launching a what the, what was called an interdisciplinary engineering program in 2009, uh, where uh, within the three streams, mechanical, electronics, and uh, computer engineering, there was a kind of uh, flavor of mechanical students studying a little bit of control systems, electronic students uh, studying a little bit about software or computer engineering students studying a little bit about hardware. This kind of mix was brought into the program in the 2009. And uh, if you look at, there were also a few product design and management courses were added. Uh, in total, about 10% of the curriculum used to be for product design and uh, humanities and management. In 2014, there, there have been significant changes also happening in the wider ecosystem uh, where um, uh, publications like the whole new engineer, which showcased the experience of all in iFoundry, those start, started coming up. Uh, there was also a study organized by the NITs, National Institutes of Technology, uh, which was called the Design Spine for NITs, uh, which was done by the India Design Council. And uh, they had proposed a model of incorporating a set of courses within the engineering program so that engineers get an exposure to product design. So similar initiatives in 2015, we have had the National Institu Institutional Ranking Framework, which came up 
Then there was a focus on implementing teaching learning centers, design innovation centers in several institutions. So these are the trends which are unfolding. And in parallel, if you see, Triple IDM Kanchipuram went through a major revision of curriculum in 2014. So the major revision led to almost like 17% credits being devoted to product design and management uh, humanities. And it was also, there was a five month credited internship added as part of this new program. And they had also launched about five new dual degree programs uh, covering um, in computer engineering, in electronics, like VLSI design, signal processing, advanced manufacturing and uh, mechanical product design. And interestingly, the Institute attracted close to 30% girl students at that point of time. And the, almost to a bit of between 2014 and 18, the intake used to have roughly about 25 to 30% of uh, girl students. Another interesting aspect was that since the Institute was launching a new slightly reoriented engineering program, the programs themselves were, or the degrees themselves were given new names. So there used to be a bachelor's of uh, technology in mechanical design and manufacturing, and uh, similarly, electronics design and manufacturing. And those kind of names are also introduced as part of the uh, initiative. So this is what happened in the, up to 2014. Now I'll talk about, uh, I had joined this institution in 2015. So we will talk about how the implementation of this program happened and uh, how it unfolded in the subsequent years. So the 2014 program, uh, when you look at from a pictorial point of view, uh, this is how it looked. The uh, uh, entire curriculum structure was the science, technology, engineering, and math courses accounted for about 83% product design and management accounted for 17%. All the colored ones in the red color boxes were the new courses which were proposed and added into the curriculum in 2014. It was implemented from 2015 onwards for the, from the second year onwards, most of these courses come into play. What you could also notice is that uh, this increase in the product design content was also at the expense of some reduction in the uh, STEM uh, the number of credits for the STEM courses. So there were already a certain set of challenges that the faculty were facing. One was the reduction of the STEM content. Second is uh, the credited internship was added, a five month internship was added as a credited program within the, uh, in the seventh semester. Now this also meant that the students will be going out of the campus. And uh, so that also eats into the credit structure in terms of course delivery and so on. A few courses were merged within the professional engineering. Wherever people felt there was some synergy emerging. So some of those courses were merged into fewer number of courses. The content was rearranged, like for example, fluid and thermal. The similarities were exploited to bring about a course which could cover both fluid and thermal. Uh, those kind of changes also were brought in. Uh, there was an element of design which was emphasized in each of the engineering courses. Engineering courses predominantly were analysis driven, uh, but uh, there was an emphasis placed on adding a detailed design element as part of these courses, which manifested into a number of courses carrying the word type design in their title. And now in terms of implementation, how it happened, we will speak later, but um, so you, at, at the outset, when you look at the curriculum structure syllabus, the word design would be very uh, prominent. Almost everywhere you will find the word design, whether it is an engineering course or a product design course and so on. Another aspect or challenge which probably the faculty in the early stages faced uh, was uh, uh, some of the STEM faculty or were encouraged to actually teach product design with the hope that they will start embracing the design elements and bring it back into their own engineering streams. With that hope, uh, some of the uh, uh, engineering faculty were asked to teach the uh, design courses. Now, this was also a challenge for people coming uh, with certain background, science and uh, math and uh, engineering background to absorb a totally a slightly different content and then deliver it and exhibit mastery on that. So these were definitely challenges that the faculty encountered. 
they had already gone through the first year implementation in the sense of uh, implementing the first year courses. And uh, this is where the um, um, I, I had technically joined in 2015. Uh, so this is the situation prior to my uh, joining the Institute. So as people started uh, exploring what Triple IDM was, uh, both from a faculty point of view, students and external stakeholders, whether it is companies and so on, a lot of questions started coming up. So in uh, Sanskrit, there is a word called neti neti, uh, which means not this, not that. So for example, somebody used to look at this institute and ask, is it a triple IT? Which means, is it an institute of information technology? Because it belongs to the cluster of institutions which fall under the triple uh, IT act. Uh, someone else would look at this institute since it was mentored by IIT Madras somewhere and a lot of faculty had PhDs from IIT Madras. Uh, they would ask the question, is it IIT Madras or is it an IIT? And uh, somebody would look at the design aspect and then say, is it a National Institute of Design? And uh, for each of these questions, the answer would be no, not this, not that. Then what is it? So this is, this is the kind of initial uh, challenges which started emerging. And uh, the degree names themselves had difficulty in the market because uh, some of the industry is used to taking people with a certain degree. And when they see a new degree coming in, they need to make sense whether is this what you call as mechanical design and manufacturing? Is it same as mechanical engineering? Um, so uh, these kind of questions. And then a bigger question was, where is this institute? Because the name Kanchipuram is tagged to the uh, title of the institute. Uh, a normal perception is that it, it is in a place called Kanchipuram. Uh, but physically, we are in Chennai. Uh, we were in Kanchipuram district, but it is physically in Chennai. So this a, created a host of um, confusion in the minds of various stakeholders uh, and, and started uh, adding to their little bit of difficulty about what this institution meant. And um, added to that, if you bring in the various permutations of how these words might play out uh, in terms of information technology, design and manufacturing, uh, the complexity only increases and uh, also leads to multiple interpretations, right? So one of the very uh, broadly, uh, if you look at the Institute's website, uh, you will find that the first interpretation is listed as the part of the Institute's uh, uh, content on the website. So it is like IT enabled design and manufacturing, uh, which means uh, application of IT into engineering design and manufacturing process like building CAD tools or developing robotics or 3D printing or product lifecycle management, industry 4.0, all these things fit into that perspective. But a, a question that one, if one can seriously ask, uh, is this not being done by other centrally funded institutions? Uh, most of them are already doing this. Uh, even when this institute came into play, some of these uh, capabilities are fairly well evolved in uh, some of the uh, centrally funded institutions. So what was the need for setting up another institute uh, on a similar line? Uh, that's a question which comes to mind. Um, second aspect is uh, there is a, another interpretation one can look at is, is this institute meant for building IT, which is both hardware and software that is unique to India's problems, right? Uh, or to foster what is today called as digital India movement and so on. Uh, but if you closely again ask the same question, aren't the computer science departments in existing institutions or the other triple ITs uh, meant to address this problem? And some institutions are doing this. Uh, some departments, computer science department in IIT Madras uh, has developed uh, the Shakti processor, which is an indigenous uh, uh, microprocessor. Similarly, there are some groups uh, in institutions like IIT Bombay, which are working on local language computing, which is called as Indic computing. And uh, so there are a few initiatives like that, but again, is there a need for another institute to just focus on these aspects? That again is a question. mark. Then comes the third one, which is a little more broader interpretation of this whole uh, uh, concept. 
which is essentially how is one able to leverage design and information technology to improve competitiveness of Indian manufacturing, make it more knowledge intensive, and at the same time, explore what is called Indianness in design or Indianness in um, uh, information technology or manufacturing. So it is both uh, for India and by India. That is the theme which emerges when we look at the third uh, uh, bubble at the bottom or the other picture at the bottom. Now this particular theme uh, is actually subsumes the, the first two themes. And uh, today, if we ask the question, is there any central institution which is actually looking into this problem and creating a talent base uh, for this kind of integral vision? Um, one can say that uh, there may not be, right? But the uh, counter question also comes is, is there really a need for this kind of institute? Is industry really desperately looking for this? Uh, that's also a question mark. So, what emerges from this is um, when you look at the original document, the project report of this uh, institute, uh, it had elements of the first and the third, right? So uh, broadly, it, uh, this third vision uh, in a way closely relates to the original document, uh, but it's a fairly very steep challenge for a faculty or departments in any, any institution. It's not an easy challenge to grapple with. It's an extremely steep challenge especially for a, when you're creating a new institute and expect that institute to build this entire brand. So that's the, in a way, I'm painting the picture of the kind of uh, context or, or the uh, vision, the co complexity that is there within the vision of this institute. Now, this is where the first cycle of implementation started happening. Uh, in 2015, there was a situation with the Institute uh, for certain reasons, um, where there was a freeze on recruitment of regular faculty or the tenured faculty, and uh, they were forced to look at uh, the um, contract or visiting faculty uh, at that point of time, between 2015 to 17, there, there was a situation of that type. And therefore, they had reached out to, they had put in advertisements. And what happened was uh, a few people joined with largely industry experience during that period. So between 2015 and 17, we had about eight to 10 people joining that uh, the institute. Uh, and most of them came with uh, strong industry experience or at least 15, 20 years of industry experience in areas like product development. Uh, this happened in a, in a way like some of us, uh, like for example, I joined and then I brought a couple of people and somebody else joined, they brought a couple of people like that it happened. But that was one very important uh, factor in the uh, implementation of this. Then second thing which also started was once we, some of us started working on these courses, the especially the third semester course called Systems Thinking for Design. Uh, we started implementing, introducing the problem-based learning method for a couple of reasons. One is the concept itself, the Institute's motto says learning by doing. So it is trying to explore that Institute's vision of uh, or, or a pedagogy of learning by doing. Second is, these were also large classes. Uh, like for example, this class strength, uh, the, the entire batch was about 240 students intake at that point of time. They were split into two batches of 120, but 120 students you need to handle through this model. Um, uh, just a teaching model will not work. And uh, therefore, uh, when we adopted a problem-based learning model, there were a lot of challenges in terms of how do you um, structure the teams, whether you should start defining a problem and so on. But what we took as a approach was uh, not to get into this problem definition or rather giving a design brief. We started with saying, let's use this to help students to do the design research as part of their thing and identify depending on their domain of interest, identify some problems which they want to work on and then give an initial shape to that. And that's how this entire course started off. But once it happened, when we implemented in the one semester, we could see a lot of traction from students. A lot of energy that students really put in and, um, uh, and also the kind of topics that they identified. 
were fairly interesting problems to look at. Uh, like as a faculty, as a researcher, we may have certain perspective towards what is a problem. But when you ask students to look at uh, what is problem from their perspective in what they are experiencing every day, we could find a fairly very nice variety of problems which had come up. Right? This gave us a lot of confidence that uh, maybe there is some value in doing this. And uh, it so happened that when we went to the next semester, when the, the fourth semester, there was again a shortage of faculty and therefore some of us had to handle these courses together. Like for example, I ended up doing this intelligent systems course and sociology of design simultaneously. But when we did these two courses, what we realized was we could drive synergy between these courses. So by keeping the problem constant, the student has identified a problem in the previous semester, but helping the student to explore that same problem through these new courses. And this is how the stitching together of these courses around a problem of interest for the students started happening, which eventually led to a kind of vertical integration of courses between the third and the sixth semester. And when we did this, it was again not possible for one faculty to do this. Luckily, because we had a few more people, like-minded people um, around, we formed informal coalitions to do this. And we didn't have a department structure in the institute at that point of time. Uh, so some of these things really helped in terms of forming these in informal coalitions and uh, getting a few more faculty to participate in this. In terms of numbers, this will be, still be about uh, 5 to 10 percent of the faculty doing this work, uh, but it was possible to create a model where you could handhold from one course to the other so that students start in the third semester with a problem and in the sixth semester they realize a proof of concept. And this is uh, also in line with the function behavior structure model that um, uh, is used in the design. So we could see a logical flow happening through this uh, structure. And this happened for this kept happening for about continuously since then. And uh, we tried a lot of things in terms of supporting the engagement in this process through multiple ways. One is uh, getting students to reflect on what they are doing getting them to actually interact with other students to understand and define problems collaboratively. Taking a problem and keeping the focus around the problem through the courses and uh, also exposing them to an external audience through industry open house events and creating an IT backbone where a lot of this content uh, was digitized. We, we recorded these classes very early because there was a teaching learning center which was set up at that point. <clears throat> and they had this infrastructure to deal with recording and so on. So we did live recording of some of these classes and also created content which uh, the students could exchange and like a uh, Google Classroom, those kind of things we implemented in 2015. But what we did see as a problem was that uh, students were not ready for an open platform discussion, right? Um, there were various difficulties. Some people cannot express, some people don't want to express. All those issues were there. But what we noticed was uh, when you talk to them in uh, teams as smaller groups or as individuals, they are far more responsive. And uh, uh, But it also meant a lot of effort to be put from a faculty perspective. So a regular faculty is not incentivized to do this because the faculties. Uh, promotion recruitment is not based on some of these parameters. But as visiting faculty with industry experience, we were not really uh, uh, affected by those kind of criteria. So in a way, we ended up spending a lot of time. So it is like a, to run a course of 240 students or 250 students in an 80 day semester, almost 45 days goes into supporting the, these activities. That is what we had actually seen after implementing this for a certain time. The next important uh, key thing development, which also helped this process was the uh, establishment of the incubator in 2016. And um, I had set up the incubator and we also created a role called the Dean for Design, Innovation and Incubation so that we could integrate the incubator with the curriculum and treat the curriculum as a kind of a supply chain which could feed into the incubator. And that started 
really uh, playing certain role in the sense the incubator because of the incubator we were able to extend the uh, network of institutions around the in new institute for for triple idm by making it visible to a wider audience and bringing various stakeholders into play at the same time from a supply chain initiative a lot of uh, activities were done to engage students and involve them in the process yeah okay so so these initiatives actually led to uh, promoting the student learning and innovation but again as i said they are not necessarily aligned with the uh, faculty's policies the another thing we also did was to take a lot of focus on analyzing the data which was emerging from these activities so we did some amount of student learning analytics and uh, understanding the competency development among students and there were a couple of publications we had also posted on this but what we also we could see some patterns in that but at the same time we use this only to create a dialogue with the students and not necessarily to profile or pinpoint and uh, things with the student it is more like a kind of a guidance for us to understand how things are heading another very important thing emerged as uh, we went through this implementation a lot of this conflict and contradiction started emerging and uh, um, instead of getting uh, very disheartened with that or getting into negativity around that we slowly turned it around to as a potential learning opportunity so some of these paradoxes that students were experiencing as part of the sociology course we used that course as a kind of a uh, uh, crucible in which we could ask the students to express the kind of contradictions they are exploring they are experiencing and also critically review that not only individually but as a group and when this started happening some new meaning started emerging in terms of what this actually design centric engineering meant and uh, the most important insight i would say is uh, students at a very high level used to say that they are learning nothing but when we started really trying to make sense of what do they mean by learning nothing what we realized is for certain students this 17% of credits was looking like 50% and for some students the 83% of credits was looking like 50% so they were either getting into when faced with a contradiction they were either getting into an either or mode or a both and mode and both are problematic so somebody assuming that it is either engineering or design is missing the story somebody who is seeing this as engineering and design is also not understanding the right way instead it is design centric engineering seen as a kind of sugar which dissolves in milk and increase the sweetness of the milk rather than being split as design and engineering or design versus engineering this is a very important insight which came out from uh, working with students and exploring their contradictions and so on but it's a, again a very challenging thing because we had to spend a lot of time doing almost one to one meetings with 200 300 students every semester and uh, one of the major validations which came for us was uh, through this uh, innovation ranking framework uh, which validated what we seem to be doing uh, we were listed in the top 25 institutions among the central institutions uh, in this ranking so this is one in a way uh, i would summarize the first iteration now sham uh, sorry sub uh, do i have how many more minutes you can have 10 more minutes okay let's see yeah thank you so now around 2020 uh, we all know uh, the pandemic came into play uh, that was one external disruption but there were a few other internal disruptions we had also experienced in terms of certain changes which had taken place within the organization and uh, uh, certain attempts to rewrite the curriculum in a manner which uh, like going back to 10 years before right and uh, so these disruptions actually led us into a much more deeper engagement uh, with several stakeholders and really start asking what should this design mean for this particular institute 
and uh, what is the future direction for this. This eventually led to the creation of the School of Interdisciplinary Design and Innovation. And um, some of the key points which emerged in terms of that consultation and the kind of model which emerged was, we started asking this question of, uh, instead of getting trapped into the dominant ideologies which are there in technology and design education, while design has a lot of value to offer, but also there are certain challenges within design education. So how do we avoid this uh, uh, potential challenges which are there on both sides? Uh, and uh, can we explore a path which is uh, avoiding these two problems, but taking the essence of these two? Because at the end of the day, we want to produce students who are comfortable building complex products, right? And uh, are willing to go through the journey and work towards uh, those kind of products and realizing those products, putting them in the market. That is the kind of characters we, we ideally want to produce. So, which means um, we need to balance these two sides, but at the same time, see if there leads to a kind of a new interpretation. That was the drive with which a lot of these consultations happened. So, one of the key things which emerged was why don't we put learning at the center and then start asking all these questions? Right? Does it enable really learning and innovation to happen? And this is again a kind of a contradiction because uh, normally people see learning and innovation as two paradoxes. How can a student learn and innovate at the same time? Uh, but there are uh, certain perspectives which if one understands the uh, intricacies behind this, then it is possible that uh, knowledge creation can happen while you're learning. And uh, it also led us to really revisit what we meant by, given that this which comes into the institute, they, they uh, take from a central uh, admission process. So students may or may not necessarily be aligned with the institute vision when they are applying and get selected for the institute. So how do we... for different students who are coming at the mandate of the institute. So we eventually identified three clusters or three categories of students that we might be nurturing. One is what we called as BTECs or engineers who have a basic orientation towards product design. Second category is where the BTEC with a minor in design came into play. And the third one is the master of design program. So this is the three um, uh, kinds of segmentation we have done. And based on that, we had created a pathway where uh, all students coming into the institute will have a certain orientation towards product design given the mandate of this institute. But those 20% of those who are inclined towards more moving in the direction of design, they can get a minor in design by doing a few more credits in that area. And those who are interested in a master's, they can come and do a master of design. Master of design also has a lateral uh, entry. And then we introduced a PhD program by design. It is an interdisciplinary design program. They may do research in different domains like physics or um, uh, any material science and so on, or uh, electronics and so on, so on. But can they absorb an element of design and imbibe that into their uh, research? so that uh, you bring a, a much broader flavor to exploring the research in any domain. With that perspective, the PhD program has also been started. So this started in uh, 2021, the MDES started in 2021. And uh, so this new program got implemented from 2020 onwards. So some of the uh, things that we are now experimenting and understanding as part of this is, uh, uh, we have sequenced, arrived at this logical sequence of building the flow from the first semester onwards, because what we see is uh, the behavioral change that we are attempting cannot happen in one course or in one semester, needs to be continuously developed over a period of time. And yeah, thank you. And one of the key challenges is uh, students coming into this process are not necessarily ready for this journey. Right? They come through a certain qualification process, but preparing them for engineering and innovation needs some more work and some amount of unlearning. 
that's where we introduce this foundation course and the sociology course in the first two semesters so that improving their engagement they are right now in a very cognitive state uh, where disembodied dis, uh, disconnected with the context that's the kind of characteristic they exhibit so getting them to start embracing or uh, connecting with a context connecting with materials around them and then being in a position to critically question and understand how they are forming opinions these two are very critical for them to start working towards product design so these two have been brought in the early stages and we are going through this implementation we are seeing some useful insights in this which we might bring out as a separate publication uh, because embodied cognition some perspectives we are trying to leverage in, in uh, addressing the first year activities and also the synergy between that and the social aspects so socio material aspect integration is something which one does not find significantly done or there is a lot of scope to further look into that that's an aspect we are trying to explore in this one uh, so overall if you say what is that we have understood in terms of embracing design and also trying to enrich design is uh, putting first of all practice in the first and both social and material and the reflexivity and practice become a very integral starting point for everything and enhancing the observation skills with a very strong emphasis on empathy and aesthetic appreciation and developing ways to abstract and synthesize in different ways not just the induction or deduction but also looking at the adaptive ways of creating new knowledge and instilling a sense of ownership and belief to make a difference so this is what we we are slowly converging towards in terms of what we mean by design centric engineering education and uh, so i would say triple it dm kanchipuram is still a work in progress and uh, we have taken some steps in this direction but still there is a lot to learn i and also it is about uh, what we started as a, as a few people uh, two or three people today it includes about uh, 20% of the organization uh, which is uh, about four or five people who are regulars uh, regular faculty within the school then we have collaborators from other departments another seven or eight people and then we have another 30% coming from the industry as adjunct faculty so we have created a model which is a mix of all three uh, it's not one silo department it is a few people uh, from and collaborators from other departments and uh, external people so that's the kind of model we have evolved for the school um so these are some of the challenges and uh, lessons that we have learned overall i'll quickly summarize two three points uh, the first most first most foremost thing is that when we are creating a new institute having a strong industry partner set of industry uh, partners in the very beginning and involved in a hands on manner is is absolutely critical here what happened was uh, it was a centrally funded institution so from funding point on point of view there was no dependency but a public private model where the industry is involved in the actual day to day activities little more by bringing in their people and other things that is very important second is when you bring these people they should also be an ecosystem which can absorb what the external people are bringing uh, instead of seeing external as unwanted and all that so that is something very important to create as a culture in the very beginning that's a very important thing that we are trying to address at a school level in a different way uh, those kind of things second is as i said uh, i already have said this uh, in terms of student development there is a, when you want to develop higher order competencies which are need of the day whether you talk about sustainable development and all this um, it cannot just be built on where the students are there is a significant amount of unlearning which needs to happen in a very controlled guided manner and um, um, this is where a lot of design pedagogy has a role, very important role to play and uh, that is something we should look at actively leveraging and uh, third is uh, if you really want to build a more student focused student centric this one then structural changes are required because right now these are still faculty centric organizations it is by the faculty for the faculty kind of model it can easily get into uh, 
if one needs to shift from that, then structural changes are required, which uh, push the focus towards students' learning and innovation. Uh, even the credit structure is designed in such a way that based on the faculty's time. So one hour theory course gets one credit, but a lab course get lesser credits. So these kind of things need to change and bring the student into focus. Some of these things can happen. Problem-based learning is extremely important to emerge or explore any synthesis of these different disciplines. Instead of um, uh, talking about interdisciplinary synthesis at a very academic perspective, if it evolves through actual practical problem solving, I think there is a great opportunity for creating a different kind of synthesis. And this is possible today in academic institutions because of the emergence of the innovation focus and the startup ecosystems. So a lot of practical work can happen in an academic context and this can really feed into new ways of rethinking uh, the knowledge base. And from a faculty point of view, it is also very important to understand that Concept and knowledge have a role to play. The CK concept, as a, we have found it extremely useful in terms of making sense of some of these ideas. So with that, I'll bring my presentation to a close. This is a picture drawn by one of our uh, students during a sandbox program to express his experience of what he experienced in a three week. Uh, he felt he went through a lot of bruises, cuts and other things, but he felt happy at the end. I think we at this stage feel in a similar way, uh, it has been an extremely grueling and difficult process. But every time we relook and synthesize and uh, uh, relook at this experience, it gives us a little more energy to keep moving. So thank you again for uh, Sub and uh, Sham and the Cree uh, community uh, for this opportunity, as well as uh, keeping our fires burning. Thank you very much. Thank you, Sudhir. Uh, I wanted to mention, I think I made a mistake. I said collective for reimagining engineering innovation, not, not in India. So the first question said, should there be India focus? Actually, it is not necessarily India focus as far as the uh, lectures and the debate is concerned and the implications. So that was the first question. So uh, uh, somebody asked, why is it India focused? So I just wanted to clarify that. And then the second part of the question, there are some aspects of anthro anthropological aspects of how technology works in a society is India. Do you think it is important to include those kind of issues in the, in the uh, those kind of issues with, to the students? including religious and other equity access to class and other things in terms of technology access. Should those topics also should be introduced in their curriculum? Um, so uh, my, my own experience has been that uh, uh, when we talk about um, curriculum, I think curriculum adding content and uh, getting into discussions around what should be there, what should not be there, uh, I feel uh, can be secondary. Right? Mm -hmm. um, my emphasis has been uh, that uh, let, let's put focus on the problem which is of interest. Mm -hmm. right? And uh, in the context of that problem, whatever comes up, we should explore that. So if some of these issues emerge in the context of that problem, they definitely need to be discussed and explored. And uh, uh, something like, uh, that's why one of the scaffolding courses, uh, we, we treat the courses of more like a scaffolding, which can be used in different ways to promote mm -hmm. this activity. Mm -hmm. uh, rather than uh, uh, introducing set of concepts on these various things. Mm -hmm. That is the way uh, I feel uh, this needs to be approached. Uh, uh, otherwise we'll still get into the same debate on what concept should be there and what should not be there. Mm -hmm. Okay. The next question is, a, there is a, he had three questions and I'm going to ask the question, but uh, you can yeah, don't, I, you don't have to answer it right away. And then you can answer the next one, I think is more important. How do you scale it to a traditional engineering college yeah, as well? So there is, you can answer yeah, both I'll, of I'll them. Take this, yeah, I'll take this question on uh, the feedback from students and all. Uh -huh. uh, yes, uh, we uh, take a regular feedback and what we have seen is 
the first feedback actually comes um, when they go for their internship mm -hmm. until then students still like one of the students comes back and tells me that uh, i have learned in 3 months a lot more than what i have learned in 3 years mm. right uh, and uh, when you really start asking what is he trying to tell right you start seeing that one of the perceptions they carry is even if you do problem based learning or you bring industry people into an academic context they believe anything done in a classroom is not real right so that is one issue which is there and um, three months spent in an industry is where they feel they have learned a lot more because they have been more actively engaged in that process of exploring something there right but the second side is many students who have gone into the internship have come back and told us that they have found themselves in a relatively better position compared to other students when they are given uncertain ambiguous problems their ability to deal with ambiguity uncertainty they felt they were slightly better off compared to students coming from other institutions now this is the first level validation we have collected consistently Uh, across also i have been tracking a lot of students who have closely worked with me about the uh, last 5 6 years um, about 60 42 60 students uh, uh, have worked with me what i have seen is uh, almost like um, 15% have taken to startups uh, about 20% of 25% have gone for uh, uh, their uh, jobs and uh, another 15 20% have gone for higher education so and uh, another 10% or 12% have gone for uh, direct phd programs so those who have actually participated in the process and absorbed it a little bit we have seen the level of maturity of the student also go up significantly now somebody said uh, can you measure there are a few instruments we have tried Uh, to really understand distinguish between students who are able to exhibit a higher level of maturity than uh, compared to other students now those instruments we have published a couple of articles on that so but those are activity based observations and uh, we can clearly see through those responses to those activities the distinctions between the uh, maturity levels of students uh, so these are some things that we could see now coming to the other question uh, whether we can scale it up or replicate again this is a question we frequently hear when i, I when i was in the industry the same thing comes up uh, when we do an experiment uh, like this and uh, bring about a change and somebody will come and ask can you scale up my response is that instead of asking the question why don't you participate in the process right it is not a magical set of rules that one can take and then replicate in multiple places it is requires people to participate and explore it in their own context in different ways but what is really required for bringing about some of these things is to create a space within the curriculum where students it, it is like an open space can be create within the curriculum which allows the student to explore along with some good facilitators that is what is really required right now it is like a curriculum overloaded with content and everybody trying to transfer the content but there is no real space for the student to explore something on their own and then come back and ask what they need to know, right but creating that kind of space can be a good starting point without emphasizing on what needs to be taught let the what needs to be taught emerge out of the practical experience in that particular context and then you give it a formal shape that will last longer and each institute given its different resource profile different input quality different uh, network needs to figure out this in their context but it all has to start with people just rolling their sleeves and start doing it so that is what i i would say it it is it is not like a magic mantra or something somebody puts a four rules and everybody follows it it may not work like go ahead and you have uh, access to the chat yes. anyway yeah yeah okay um, there is a question on challenge based learning ill defined learning 
yeah um see we we have taken an approach of broadly taking just, just to give you a remark as... just to give you a remark frido is from tu delft he runs a product design program and he's remarking for on your talk yeah yeah so frido the um, what we have done is uh, we, we didn't get into this specific definitions of starting with the design brief right we in fact the third semester course we said doing design research itself is part of a problem based learning let the student explore uh, first of all as a group of collective students create a mechanism where they can identify what is their domain of interest if they are interested in uh, doing something in transportation then let them go through the process of doing a design research and coming up with a design brief that itself we made it as a first course that they uh, went through and this is very challenging for most students because they are not trained into this process and uh, uh, it's very easy for them to get distracted and uh, lose interest and all that can happen so this is where the facilitation process is very important and the faculty may not be an expert in all those things but still if you have people who can just manage that process and keep the students to keep focusing on certain things and help them navigate that space without necessarily spoon feeding that is a of significant value and uh, when we did this in the first three batches we could find very interesting problems coming up from the students perspectives mm -hmm. right uh, which uh, from a faculty point of view may look like uh, uh, they don't even know the basics why are they talking about this but um, if you explore what they are saying in different like i'll give you a, a simple example of uh, one of the um, quirky ideas that came out when uh, we conducted a uh, competition around space de debris challenge uh, this was done along with the uh, isro so when we posted this question one student uh, if most of the people students were looking at solutions where you will catch the debris and bring it back right but uh, one student came up with a view saying why should i bring it back why can't i just push it into a different orbit space is huge and uh, why should i waste my time bringing everything back and why can't i push it into a different orbit now practical realization of this there could be a lot of challenges but the thought process of a student to explore something new and this is a first year student right that is the spark that needs to be explored which may eventually lead to a different problem statement or something else but that spark is what um, i felt uh, we could really pay attention to and nurture and uh, so that is the view we have taken as far as the uh, problem based learning is concerned and some of the um, success stories i wouldn't say major success stories yet but through this process we have seen at least eight student teams coming into our startups in the last 3 years um, and and most of them since they have already spent about 3 4 years nurturing this right from the idea stage problem stage to idea and all that their commitment to explore this startup journey uh, appears much a uh, result to explore this much appears much strong so that is something we have seen but still there are lots of problems lots of um, uh, difficulties and uh, all all those kind of things still exist uh if there aren't uh, uh, yeah there is another new message uh, i think everybody would like uh, 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 feedback link and uh, umang is preparing a feedback link and he'll put it in asap uh, or send it to you by email so that you can provide feedback thank you very much uh, sudeep and uh, it's been a great lecture and the responses have been great and i think this is the beginning of a, a journey for us to bring all the different perspectives from different parts of the world as well as different experiments in india and uh, our next uh, uh, lecture is professor pvm rao uh, uh, i mentioned it is on uh, reimagining engineering as a verb and not Uh, as a noun or design as a verb and not as a noun 
So uh, I hope you will join us again and we will send out the invitation uh, soon for that to all of those who have registered. And those of you who are interested in pre, please send us an email uh, so that uh, if you are also doing some experiments in engineering education, we would be very happy to have you present your approach. Uh, as uh, Sudhir said, not only an open space for education, we need open space for imagining our future engineering and innovation. And I hope you will all join in this endeavor and, uh, uh, and we look forward to your participation in future lectures. And if some of you want to participate in some other discussion, please contact us. Thank you very much. If there's no, there are no more questions, I will bring this session to a close. Any other comments? Uh, so, yeah. Just an update. I've shared the feedback form in the chat. Yeah, I just saw that. Yeah, great. Uh, any other comment, uh, Sudhir? You're, you're fine? Yeah? Yeah, I'm fine. I just had one observation. Somebody mentioned about why India specific. Um, so Cree is not India specific. We are yeah. looking at yeah. uh, reimagining engineering in a broader sense. Uh, but uh, the case I presented is India specific because this is an Indian institute funded by the government of India. And we are trying to explore what is meaningful for a public funded organization. So much of the discussion that I had presented is to do something in an Indian context, which is the need of the hour as far as the, from a government perspective goes. Yeah. Yes, thank you for clarification. I made a mistake in the beginning. I said reimagining engineering in India when I introduced it's actually engineering innovation, uh, uh, Sham pointed out. Thank you for the clarification. Thank you very much. It has been great having you. Hopefully you will invite other friends of yours to participate in these uh, lectures. And all of you have a good evening and thank you very much. <laughs>